Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar, Archaeological Adventures with a Marla Mira HDR. My name is Mike Langton. I'm one of the application engineers at Guideline Geo. I specialize in the GPR range of products within Guideline Geo. Um, my contact details are there on the screen. Please feel free to email me uh, any point uh, if you have any questions or queries about the GPR systems and or its applications. Guideline Geo manufacture um, two product ranges. We have the ABM product range. This is where we design, uh, develop and produce, manufacture the seismic resistivity and TEM instrumentation. And on the Marla side, this is where we manufacture, design and manufacture the GPR range of products. Um, we are based in Sweden, head offices in Stockholm, and we have factory um, based in the town of Marlow, and the research and development is in Umeå in the north of Sweden. But like I say, we've got various offices and people based around the world covering all the continents. So today's agenda, um, I'm just going to go through a quick introduction and a brief history of the MIRA system. I'm going to talk about a little bit about the theory behind the 3D GPR data sets. So how we go from 1D through 2D and onto 3D. Um, just roughly run through the, the MIRA principle, and then I can move on to some archaeological case studies for some recent work that we've carried out with the MIRA HDR. Um, at any point throughout the presentation, uh, if you have any questions, um, please um, open up the chat box and drop your question into the chat box and I will deal with those towards the end of the presentation. So we'll have a session at the end for questions and answers. So the his history of, uh, of the uh, MIRA system, we can go way back to 1999 um, where we developed and launched the Marla cart. This is the predecessor to the MIRA. Um, but the CART was the computer aided radar tomography system uh, that was first um, launched, the first commercially available array system on the market. Um, moving forward a little bit in time to uh, 2007, um, where we first used the system um, for archaeology at the Uppsala Cathedral in Sweden. Later that year, we were redesigning and building the new version of the CART, which was the MIRA system. MIRA stands for Marla Imaging Radar Array. At the core of that system was the ProX, uh, and in particular, its parallel processors, which enabled us to run a lot quicker than the older system, the CART system. But that, that speeded up the efficiency of the data collection quite considerably. Um, in 2008, we launched the uh, 16 channel 400 megahertz MIRA that became available. And then later on in about 2012, we introduced and first sold the, the mini MIRA, which was a half size system system to the 16 channel, so an eight channel system, uh, more compact and, uh, uh, and, and smaller to use. Some of the early data collection that, that the MIRA was involved in. Here's one um, example. This is the Canon Tomb Roman Gladiator um, site in the east of Austria, very close to uh, to the border, um, just near near Vienna. Um, it was a Ludwig Boltzmann Institute that started to undertake a large um, archaeological prospection of the area of, of Canon Tomb. Um, and over a period of time, they purchased several systems um, for, for here and other areas around Europe. But here's some, some of the data sets from, from that site. Uh, image of the field in the top right hand corner, and then the results from that uh, data collection of that area in, in, the, in the bottom section there. Very clear, nice data from Carnantum, some really good results. And the work's still ongoing at Carnantum, um, even today, um, with the new system um, now in place. Some other achievements um, by the MIRA, um, 
one notable is his his work down in Stonehenge. Now we're not talking about the actual circle area. The, the stone circles are very famous um, stone circles that you can see there in the image in the background. Um, but we're talking about the wider landscape, the Stonehenge landscape, which covers over a much larger area. Um, the, the data was collected um, by the LBI in conjunction with universities at Birmingham, Bradford, Ghent and St Andrews. And this was, um, like I say, a large, large project over the area. And they're still producing results and reports from, from that um, large scale data collection. Another one um, was up in Norway, and this is the um, famous um, ship burial that was recently published, I'm talking about the Jellystad um, ship burial. And this was by the guys up at NIKU, Norwegian National Heritage Board. And they conducted a large survey of the burial mound um, in 2018. Um, this is the some of the results some of the time slices that were was produced and that the time slices bouncing up and down um, through the depths. Um, and we can see a number of features in the data there, burials, burial mounds, but in particular one um, that you can see there just towards the center of the image, um, highlighting um, the actual ship burial itself. Um, this is quite a rare find um, for, for Viking, Viking, arche Viking archaeology. Um, and uh, you see the image there quite nicely of the of the ship. Not just the um, not just the ship, the the, the wide landscape there. Again, um, highlighting then in the top left image um, some long houses, and you can see the post holes from the construction um, of 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 those buildings. Quite nicely outlined there by those those dots in effect um, in the data. So moving on to a little bit of theory on behind the um, GPR principle, particularly the 3D GPR principle. I'm just going to take a step back a little bit and just have a look at a single channel system to start off with, and just to show you how we build up um, from that single channel through to 3D. This is a side view of a typical standard um, single channel shielded antenna. We we'll peel that away. Um, inside we have two antennas. One is the transmit antenna, the TX transmitter, and the other is the RX, the receiver. And in essence, what we do, we launch a signal from the transmitting antenna. At that moment in time, we start a, in effect, a recording on the receiving antenna on the RX. And what we're going to see just on the left hand side here is the response on the receiving antenna. Um, so that signal is launched. It travels out through the ground in a semi-circular fashion in this image. Um, that signal will expand outwards and travel, first of all, through the soil. But also we have a, an effective wavefront that will travel directly from the transmit antenna to the receiving antenna. Still, this is um, nothing happening on the receiving antenna. We've started at the top on this recording and the vertical axis here is a measurement of time. So as time goes on, that's expanding in the vertical axis. So the first thing that's going to happen here is the, the this direct wave, the air wave, what we refer to, uh, often referred to, um, actually travels from the transmit antenna to the receiving antenna. Um, this is the first response that we will see on the receiving antenna. So we get this response in the form of this trace here on the left hand side. Um, the main signal that we're looking at here, the, the ground, see the ground wave in effect that's traveling through the soil. That's expanding outwards and traveling. Um, and we have a target here in the soil. A, an effect, this target is a change of electrical properties. Oh, it has um, a change of electrical properties. And where we get a change of electrical properties, um, some or all of the energy can be reflected back depending on the type of uh, target or material. But in essence, some of that energy will be um, reflected from that target. Okay. Just a split second later, here after the airwaves travel through the receiving antenna, um, we get a little bit of ground wave kicking through 
and we get a small response there on the uh, receiving antenna. So the target here is going to reflect some of the energy and that's going to travel back to the surface. So at this moment in time, nothing's happening on the receiver antenna, so it's a nice flat line, a vertical line, until that energy travels back to the surface, back to the receiver, and that's recorded as that response, as you can see on the red trace there, often referred to as the wiggle trace. That is, in effect, one measurement. One shot of signal into the ground by the GPR. So that's recorded. Now, what we're going to do at this point, we're going to um, um, convert that image into a grayscale plot, as you can see here. And then as we move the radar forward at set intervals, at measurement or trace intervals, it's going to take a measurement as we move the radar forward. And so it's going to create these shots of signal into the ground and, and recordings side by side. And this is where we're going to create the radar gram in effect. The radar gram is a 2D measurement. Um, so the, 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 the trace to the left is referred to as the 1D measurement, and that gives us our Z value or Z value, our vertical measurement. Uh, the 2D is our X measurement. So we have measurement of uh, distance across the top axes, and at this moment in time, a measurement of time. So that's all the radar is doing at this point is measuring time, how long it's taking for the energy to travel to the feature or target and back to the surface again. So that's our 2D measurement, our X, in effect, our X value. So we've got our Z value, vertical, we've got X, our, our X measurement. So when it comes to the mirror, the principle of the mirror, um, typically that's just one recording, one profile, one trace, but with the mirror itself, we've got channels side by side over the width of the array, and we are going to measure multiple profiles at the same time. And this is what we refer to as a swath. But what this enables us to do is to stack the data together in this cube, in effect. And we are able to look now across this area. And what we can do is we can create these slices in time, what we refer to as time slices or depth slices. And we can go down um, the data, look at these time slices from above. This is our third dimension. Um, this enables us to now be able to create volumes of data over these um, plan view and we can create these nice images as we run down these time slices these depth slices so here we're going from the top down to the bottom of the time window back to the top again and this is just cycling round but the the effect here is we can now start to um, see structure and features in the ground and in particular things like buildings um, and other um, construction, man-made construction, quite typically, um, with with this type of uh, data collection. They see this, like I said, just the time slices just running round and round and going down from top to bottom. These uh, time slices. So the principle here is we're going to collect these um, lines of data parallel to each other, um, and we refer to this as the swath. So we're going to continuously simultaneously create this block of data in one pass um, with the system. Um, we're going to continually to cover the area, travel up and down across the area, collecting data without any gaps um, between the swaths. So we're covering the area 100% um, with the system. Um, this high resolution data set now, because we're starting to take measurement at very tight channel spacing and inline measurement, the trace interval um, as we move along the profile line um, really depends on, on a few things. That the, the quality of the data depends on identical antenna signatures. So each antenna has got to be as close to each other from a signature point of view. We need to consider the uh, central frequency. That's going to have an effect on the resolution um, and the distance between the channels, the data channel density. 
And with the system, with the Marlon Mirror HDR, um, we have a six and a half centimeter channel space in between each of the profiles. And typically when we're collecting data, we're going to collect six, six and a half centimeters in line. So as we're taking those traces every six centimeters in line and cross line, we have six and a half centimeters between the channel spacing. There's one other thing we need to take into consideration as well um, when we're collecting the data is the positioning. We need high accuracy um, positioning. And that will typically come from um, either a RTK GNS, GNSS GPS or total station. We need to be getting down to centimeter accuracy um, with the positioning um, when we're collecting that data for good quality, um, effective data. So let's move on to the Mira HDR. Um, in uh, about around 2020, we launched the Mira HDR. HDR technology has been around now for about 10 years. This is based around um, real time sampling and um, high levels of stacking. Um, but the, the Mira HDR is a, it's a, it's a system, the standard antenna is a 1.4 meter wide antenna, 22 channels. Um, within that box, and it has a central frequency of 500 megahertz. And as I brief previously mentioned, there six and a half centimeters. Um, some of the features then of the HDR technology, it's based around the real-time sampling, which um, gives us improved data quality. Um, and this is through a number of um, improvements over the antenna design and the sampling of the signal, um, which leads on to increased bandwidth. We have a decreased noise flow um, through the HDR technology, which gives us additional bandwidth. Additional bandwidth will give us um, better, deeper depth penetration because we get a, a lower frequency across the bandwidth. We also get higher resolution due to the high frequency end of the spectrum. But the antenna itself is broadcasting over a large um, range of of uh, bandwidth of frequencies in effect. So on to uh, um, some of the case studies then. Uh, let's move on to some of the data from the Mira HDR. And on this one, I'm going to take you way north in the UK, um, right over the English Scottish border, um, up to an area um, of a Roman settlement called Trimontium. And uh, that's quite close to um, to Melrose in Scotland. Here we have a um, artist in impression of um, Trimontium. Trimontium is a Latin a Latin name, and it's meaning the place of three hills. And you can just see there in the image in the background, one of the peaks, one of the hills um, from where it got its its name. But this is in the artistic impression for the uh, the settlement. The Roman fort. Um, this is was built in 79 AD. This is following on from the invasion of uh, the Roman Empire into the area of what we now call England and Wales um, in in 43 AD, approximately. Um, the Roman Empire slowly advanced northwards after that time, and the the fort was constructed, as I said, in around um, 49 AD. And it so there's the artistic um, impression, and this is the site as it stands today from approximately the same angle as the uh, as the artist uh, um, image there in the previous slide. Um, you can see there the peaks in the background again. But there's some nice crop marks showing in the image. Um, we now have this um, uh, more modern day boundary, field boundary running across the sides. Uh, but here we can see quite clearly some of the um, features of the, the settlement, the outer boundary wall, and the main road running through the centre there. Um, so the area that the, we collected here um, was around this section, um, just to the to this side of the, uh, the uh, field boundary. My colleague, Jimmy Adcock, on this occasion, went and did the data collecting. This is Jimmy. On the quad, um, we've got the GNSS um, GPS there sat on top of the, the antenna. So we use a quad bike to pull the system, makes it much more efficient. And the laptop was sat on the front of the, uh, 
of the quad bike there for the for the data collection and control of the antenna. The area was approximately two hectares, um, and that was collected um, in a day um, by Jimmy and the rest of the team um, up there. Let's take a look at some of the data then um, from the site. This is a time slice um, and an AVI actually. I'm going to run a, a, a video recording here of the time slices um, as we go from the surface here down through the depth. Um, and if you can just make out just to the side of the axis here, we have the, the depth value, um, approximate depth value of each of the time slices as it runs through. So I'll run this for you. So now we're running down, dropping down now. It's about 0.3 of a meter. The archaeology will start to kick in in a second. You can start to see the outline of the, the buildings and the construction. We're now just passing about one meter. And as we get down to the deeper depths, you'll start to see um, the deeper sections of the construction, the foundations of the, the buildings. We're now down to about two meters and the archaeology starts to fade out. And so I'm going to start to bring it back to the surface now. So 1.7, 1.6, 1.5. And that will run back to the water surface. So clear indications here of the um, of areas of the of the Roman fort. Um, quite visible, quite nice there. And back to the surface now. Towards the end of that AVI. And here we can even see some of the track marks um, from the vehicles that have been running across the site. This is effectively site compression of the of the soil um, that's indentation in the soil that's causing that response very close to the surface. I'll run that one more time for you just to see that again. And then again, running back to the surface again, towards the surface. Okay, so the next um, case study that I want to talk about is the return of time team um, time team um, if, you, if you're not familiar with this is a popular british tv show archaeology show it ran for over 250 episodes um, from 1994 through to 2014 and um, the most uh, the vast majority of the sites were based in and around the uk but there were um, some overseas work included in in those um, investigations, uh, one being Jamestown in Virginia in the USA. Um, the TV show was broadcast um, not just in the UK, but over 40 countries around the world. And still very popular now um, from from a catch up point of view. Um, key um, Mala contributions throughout that time, um, even going back to the early days, um, the top image there is a screenshot from one of the very early recordings, and this is my colleague Jesper Emelson um, in the grey top there. He's um, collecting some data with one of the very early GPR systems, and this was actually the first time that that GPR was actually shown on the Time Team show. Um, and just alongside there is is John Gator taking a very keen um, interest in the data as Jesper collected that data. Um, but yeah, that was uh, a Roman, again, Roman site, um, Pap Castle in the northwest of England near Carlisle. Um, but we successfully located some Roman remains two meters below that private garden that you could see there. Um, moving on a little bit more in time, going on to about 2010, so where I was involved in a few of the uh, few of the shows, and um, we had um, the 16 channel system, the older mirror system um, was deployed. And then later we loaned um, a eight channel mini mirror system 
um, for the entirety of the final season. And that's me down there in the bottom right hand corner alongside with Graham, collecting some data, um, in that case, pulling it with this um, ATV, pulling the antenna with the ATV, uh, utilizing in this case, a, a robotic total station. That's the prism that you can just see on top of the antenna box there um, in the bottom right hand corner. Um, so that TV show finished in 2014, but there hasn't been a return recently. The format has changed slightly. Um, the TV show now crowdfunded um, and is currently online um, for two brand new episodes in starting in 2021. And that's moved on to this year where you'll see some more episodes coming later this year. Second episode um, was shot near Broughton Castle in Oxfordshire. Um, and um, this was again a Roman villa. Um, found within the um, castle estate and according to the aerial photographs um, the villa may have been the same size as Buckingham Palace in London so quite a substantial um, villa um, construction there. So the Miro HDR was deployed to cover quite a large area and that was carried out by myself uh, and my colleague Jimmy Adcock um, in co collaboration with John Gate and the time team crew. Now Jimmy has had a long um, working relationship with um, the time team. He has been on over 80 um, of the TV shows. So I had to get one of the older photographs there in this presentation of Jimmy, um, just there on, on the right of this photograph, along with um, Tony Robinson, the main presenter from the early episodes, um, the, the 20 years. Uh, episodes, 20 years worth of episodes, alongside the late uh, Mick Aston, very famed for his uh, very colourful um, jumper tops. And there's Will in the background. I think it was Will, if I remember correctly, one of the camera guys um, uh, here taking some, uh, obviously, um, some images of, of the data from, from the laptop that Jimmy was processing the data. Um, the site then, Broughton Castle Estate site, this is the uh, an aerial image. We had two areas that where we collected the data. The main area, um, which covered about four and a half hectares of data collection, was in the field in the top of this image. And you can just see the, the uh, quad bike down there in the, in the lower field of this image. This is where we, we um, collected a small area for remains of a, a sarcophagus. But the main area, like I said, was four and a half hectares that was collected um about it was about one day's worth of data collection split over two days um, but it was about one day's worth of data collection to collect that one and a half hectares uh, the field had been plowed and rolled so it's quite a nice smooth surface so we're able to collect at some reasonable speed for the data collection and you can see the excavators there coming in to help with some of the excavations um, there in the top image the results from that site um, is a series again of series of time slices running from um, the surface down, um, down to about one and a half meters from the surface, and just like I say, um, rerunning around that, that those time slices. Um, in the um, shallower time slices, you can see these very sharp linear responses in the data. Um, these are more modern um, construction. These are um, land drains the farmers installed um, more recently. Um, but you can see there in the center we have um, an area where we're getting some responses, um, a clear outline of the, the huge Roman villa um, and the, the measurements um, from the ranges are approximately 80 meters um, across the top there. Um, what you will notice with this data though as, as I'm close to the surface is quite a um, in effect, a blurring of the of the of the, of the response, and it, this is where the archaeology is relatively close to the surface. And over time, through farming and in particular the ploughing, um, the ploughing has has hit and struck the archaeology and broken the archaeology and spread the archaeology, um, the material over a large area. Um, sometimes referred to as is plough spreading or plough spread. As you can see there the, the the darker images, but as we go deep, you can see the the lower construction of the archaeology coming more visible. So we've got the, the, the two ranges that have, um, are quite visible here, a northern range and an eastern range of the of the building. 
there's um, remains of a, a um, potent, other potential building further to the south. And there was no real western range um, visible. All we could see there was actually an indication of a um, of a wall line, a boundary line, boundary wall in effect, um, rather than the actual range itself. So the, the building here, the, the villa had in effect two ranges, two side, a northern and a, an eastern range. Um, yeah. Just to the south, some of your eagle eyed people amongst you will notice also a building down there to the south. And this is the um, separate bathhouse, very typical um, construction. But within that, we can see the hypercoast uh, in the data. This is the uh, underfloor heating um, facility for that bathhouse. So the bathhouse was heated, um, with this underfloor heating um, construction referred to as the hypercoast. So that was the uh, results from, from, from Broughton Castle. Uh, another site that we've been working on is um, Sutton Hoo, Sutton Hoo in East Anglia, southeast of England. It's an Anglo-Saxon site, a very famous um, ship burial site from the Anglo-Saxon age. Um, we were asked to come down there and collect some data, and we um, on this occasion utilised an electric ATV, which I must admit was very nice, very quite, quite pleasant to drive. Um, across the area. This, this section here is outside of the burial um, grounds. This is a, a garden field that runs um, adjacent to the visitor centre. Um, we started collecting data in this area. Again, with uh, an RTK GNSS mounted on the, the GPR, and the laptop was mounted in the cab of the ATV for the data collection. That's where Jimmy sat there, um, ready to collect the data while I was driving across the field. Um, oh, I've got something to show you, something hot off the press, something quite new. This, um, you can see there, the image there is the is the cart system that we've utilised, but we've now redesigned that. Um, this has been launched um, very soon. This is the um, the new field trailer. This is a prototype that you've seen here. Um, there's a few finer adjustments or changes to the final product, but in essence, that's what it's going to look like. Um, this is the much more improved field trailer, trailer like I said, that's going to be available um, pretty much as we speak. So back to the uh, back to Sutton Hoo then. Um, what I will say, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to show you any data at this point. Um, sorry about that, but um, investigations are ongoing, um, but we will be able to produce some data at some point in the future. So, so as they say, watch this space. So in the meantime, I'm just going to leave you with a couple of images from the burial ground um, just to have a quick look at. So thank you very much for your attention. I very much appreciated. Um, I have a couple of thank yous to mention um, just to call out here. Um, first of all, thank you to Time Team and in particular John Gator on the left hand side of this image. Um, John is a long-standing geophysicist um, that's been there right from the beginning, and it was John that invited us down to to work with him on the data collection. So thanks to John. I also got to say thanks to our distributor in the UK, Sigma Solutions. Um, they loaned us uh, the antenna that you can see in the images that you've seen throughout this presentation. This is their system that they have available. Um, so they loaned us that. So thank you to the guys at Sigma. And also finally to Kate Armstrong at AOC Archaeology. Um, Kate's the, um, the geophysicist, the archaeological geophysicist who's been working up at Trimontium, the Trimontium Trust, um, working alongside the, um, the volunteers um, up there at Trimontium. Um, also, there's a, a very good web page for the trust that you can take a look at if you're interested in seeing a bit more information about Trimontium. But yeah, once again, thanks to Kate for inviting us and allowing us to show some of that beautiful data that I showed you earlier. So in a moment, I'll just move on to the um, questions and answers. Um, so I will just go take a look at the chat box and see if we have anything um, from that. So just bear with me a second. <coughs> 